Paperback Rocker, episode 80. Hey, this is Matt Severson, the Paperback Rocker, and I'm broadcasting from my 6 by 9 foot cinder block shack in the desert of northern Mexico, southern Texas. Welcome and thanks for checking out my show. It's hot outside. It's hot inside. It's Texas, y'all. What do you expect? Hey, everybody. What's up? Welcome to episode 80 as we creep ever closer to the century mark of the paperback rocker show, my podcast that I have had for a number of years now that basically nobody listens to, but what the heck? Maybe someday I'll get a huge following from all this work I put into making this entertainment for you, broadcasting into the ether, the ethernet. I'm reading now on the Paperback Rocker Show from my book, Blue Whiskey. It's a hardback. It's also available on Kindle, and you can purchase that at Amazon, or you can drop me a line at paperbackrocker at live.com and send me some money, and I'll send you a copy Whatever you do, uh, I hope you're enjoying the story. We're on the top of page 139, and I'm not going to recap. Hopefully you've been following along enough to know what is going on. Basically following the exploits of Stanton Wheelhouse III. Okay, here we go. He is hanging out with the old lady who played guitar behind Loretta back in Butcher Holler, apparently. And they're trading songs in this little country store out in the middle of nowhere on the uh, northeast coast of the United States, not far from the ocean. Well, go ahead and play the song, she, she said. I'd rather play you one of my originals. I didn't write that other one. I'm listening. I played Down and Out on Bourbon Street for her. I entered the performance trance and didn't exit the song didn't exit until the song was done. I felt groggy afterward. You coming out of the tunnel? She asked. The tunnel? I played dumb. I knew exactly what she was talking about, but I wanted to hear what she had to say. I used to call it the mine shaft when I was playing with Loretta, but I quit calling it that after I lost my boys. What exactly are you talking about, Lydia? <clears throat> Well, for me, I, I kind of just glaze over and go into a trance. It was less when I was playing behind Loretta, but when I started doing my own songs, I was like a singing zombie. You looked the same way. I laughed. I know what you're talking about, but I don't have much experience. I don't think I feel it as strong as you. Stanton, listen to me, son. I'm going to tell you what I've learned over the last 70 years. I'm going to give it to you for free. Please take it to heart. Yes. Practice your songs until you can think about your grocery list while you play. I mean where you don't have to think one bit about what the next chord or lyric is. Autopilot, I said. Yes, sir. You may get sick of them, but always remember that they're your songs and love them like they was your babies. I do, I said. Take real pride in them. I do, Lydia. Good. Once you get to that level, you're ready to start playing them for people the right way. That's where all that practice pays off. I'm listening. That's when you let that song come out of you like it's a demon being exercised. It's all about the vocal because the guitar is just an accompaniment. Don't neglect your performance on the guitar, of course, but your voice is the instrument that delivers the raw emotion that people will cotton to. Closing your eyes makes it easier to get into the tunnel because it eliminates distraction. Sing every song like it's the last time you're ever going to do it, and you're singing to Jesus himself on top of that. You understand? 
No holding back, I said. I want to be like that. I'm trying to do it now, but I'm not that far along. I've been in the tunnel a few times, but I want to live there. You'll get there, son, if everything you think about and do is done to support your music. I came to that same conclusion a few days ago. I guess we was destined to meet then. I think so. Is there anything else you can tell me about the mine shaft? The tunnel, she corrected. Stanton, when you get to where I'm talking about, you will understand it all at once and in toto, probably better than me. That knowledge will be forever, and it'll be as easy as slipping your foot in a slipper. I'm a good judge of things, and I say you're turning the corner on it. What do you think? I'm growing as a person and as a musician every day, thanks to people like you. I'm learning some good life lessons. Lydia smiled. It's a good thing you're aware of them. Most people only figure life out after it's already passed, and that's too late. They wait years and years. You need to personally reflect on every damn... (laughs) You need to personally reflect every damn day. Lydia laughed happily. Thanks for making an old woman remember the passion she once held. You've still got it. Well, it's been doing a good job of hibernating, she said, still smiling. I still haven't told you the most important thing I know. I'm listening, I said. I can see that, she said. Root beer? No, thanks. She took her sweet time draining the last of her bottle, then got up and moseyed to the refrigerator, then took more time rummaging in a cabinet drawer for the bottle opener that should have been on top of the fridge. She opened the bottle and took a long drink and looked at the bottle in her hand with satisfaction, shaking her head a little. How do they do it? she asked rhetorically. She appeared to have forgotten my presence, marveling how wonderful it was that someone had managed to concoct, bottle, and convey this wonderful nectar to her. Lydia, for God's sake, I said, are you going to tell me or not? Tell you what, she asked. Forget it, I said, exasperated. Now I remember, she said, as she took her previous spot standing behind the counter. She had a mischievous grin and looked surprisingly young. Always leave them wanting more, she said, looking into my eyes with the demeanor of a satisfied teacher. I smiled. I understood what she had just modeled for me. Lesson learned. Leave the audience wanting more. I bought some groceries before leaving, and Lydia gave me directions to a spot where I could sleep by the Atlantic. This was going to be my last night on the road. New York City was only about 250 miles away. I planned to leave at my leisure mid-morning and meditate on my future during the drive. As for that night, I planned to reflect on my journey thus far. I took the hand-drawn map Lydia gave me out of my pocket, which she said would lead me to a secluded spot where I could safely camp on the beach. She said she'd been going there for decades, and I wouldn't have anything to worry about. Lydia also gave me a jug of moonshine she said was special. She said it was very old, from Butcher Holler. She called it Blue Whiskey. I pulled away from the little sundry store and found the road on Lydia's map, that would lead me to the ocean. Though she had drawn it as a straight line, it turned every which way, so trees obscured my view of the horizon in front of me. I had the windows down, though, and I sensed the ocean was near. With some suddenness, I exited the trees and found Wonderlust in danger of becoming stuck in the sand. I panicked a bit, but wheeled her around and parked near the trees where the ground was firm above the tree roots. I smiled thinking of Lydia, and hopped out. I went to the back doors and flung them wide to retrieve what I needed for the evening. The sun threatened its descent, so I picked a spot on the beach to make a fire. It felt like the night would be cold, and I would be sleeping in the open air with the waves and wind all around me, so I gathered a mass of dry limbs from the pine trees and built an impressive mound. 
I stockpiled extra wood since I knew the wind would fuel the burn. When I had a nice bonfire going, I walked down the beach to retrieve a large piece of driftwood I spied. It was desiccated, but still very heavy, so I dragged it on the sand to a spot near the fire. It would be my bench seat for the evening. When the sun plummeted, or sorry, the sun plummeted fast since the wall of trees obscured my view to the west. I watched its reflection on the waves until it passed the horizon. I opened a tin of sardines and ate them on crackers, feeling like a happy vagabond. I would be in New York City by this time the next night. I smiled as I thought about that, and a shiver of nervous energy coursed through me. When I finished eating, I sat and watched the waves. The full moon reflected on them, and the wind whipped around me. I was cold, so I hunkered inward and hugged myself. The blood in my body rushed to my stomach to aid digestion, and I became sleepy. I came to consciousness about an hour later. I had been in a meditative state, a deep daydream, somewhere between communing with nature and praying, staring at the waves with my eyes glazed over. Now I felt groggy, like I had been in that bottomless tunnel Lydia talked to me about. The wind had lessened, but it was still chilly. I felt the sudden need to play my guitar. I pulled it from its case behind me, but my fingers were cold and didn't want to cooperate. <clears throat> I threw more wood on the fire, and the intensity of the blaze increased almost immediately. The sappy branches made the air smell of pine, and they popped loudly as they burned, throwing coals onto the sand. I unrolled my sleeping bag and unzipped it all the way, so it was like a blanket. I threw it over my shoulders and moved the piece of driftwood closer to the fire. I sat down and warmed my fingers, warmed up my fingers by playing a simple instrumental. This was an intense experience. The fire blazed. The waves crashed. The pines swayed. The wind whipped. The moonshine Lydia gave me was in a large pottery jug caked with hardened dust. I pulled the cork and took a swig and felt it warm me inside. It tasted more like wine than whiskey. I poured some in my hand, and it wasn't blue either. I closed my eyes and strummed my guitar, consciously avoiding playing anything familiar. I took a few more swigs over the next half hour. I plunged into an even deeper meditation, but this was active. The tunnel is about playing things you already know, but this was an exploration of my consciousness via music. I played random chords, singing and humming along, uttering stream of consciousness words and phrases. Mother, Father, I have not forsaken you. Forgive me for my free will. Son of Faulkner, you are always my companion. Stuff like that drawn out and repeated ad infinitum in chants. I also had fits of primal screaming, Sister, take your lens off me! There will be no documentary! I drank from the jug and hurled branches onto the fire during breaks in my sound and fury. This went on through the night until the earth had completely circled the sun. It came up fast and I forced myself to gaze into it, even though it hurt my eyes. Without thinking, I launched into one of my Spanish flamenco bulerias. I was sunblind and sweating from the intense heat of popping pine logs. I laughed like a maniac, playing furiously. I howled like a pagan and screamed like a banshee. I peeked as the sun broke the horizon, attacking my guitar as if it was my mother's enemy, screaming myself hoarse. I stared defiantly into the glowing orb, which was both God and my father, my eyes burning and weeping. Do not forsake me, for I am your son, I cried. I had never felt particularly spiritual before, but I was ecstatic, in rapture. Finally, I was spent and exhausted and stumbled to the Chevy, dragging the sleeping bag in one hand and my guitar in the other. I fell into the back, shut the doors, and blacked out.
I woke up as if I was the first conscious being to ever scuttle from the wet, from the foam of some primordial ooze. Oops. Of some primordial ocean. I knew nothing. I felt cold, wetness, receded, and devolved back into the ooze. An hour later, I tried to rise again. I heard deep, resonant piano playing mixed with the sound of the crashing waves, the angry pounding of tempest on the vertical grand of our childhood. I moaned, struggling to break out of the sleeping bag I had wrapped around me like a cocoon, unsure of whether I had metamorphosed into a large Kafkaesque insect overnight. I took a deep breath and detected the biting odor of ammonia. My eyes rolled in my head and I receded again. Finally, my eyes opened wide and I brought my hands to my face with a simultaneous slap on each cheek. My eyelids wanted to close again, so I forced them open with my fingers and saw the familiar roof of wonderlust above me. I raised up, feeling like a wedge, trying to pry into the simple reality I had once known. I shuddered, surrounded by cold wetness and smelled ammonia again and knew I had wet myself. My initial coherent thought as the cardinal man emerging from the evolutionary soup was, I pissed myself. How profound was that? I blasted into the wide awake and thrust the back doors open. Throwing my soiled sleeping bag to the sand in one motion, followed by my wet pants. I knew there was nobody around, so I walked naked with only my shirt on into the ocean. I entered tentatively, then rushed in until I could rest on my knees, in water up to my chin. The remnants of the bonfire glowed on the sand, and bits and pieces of the previous night came back to me. I lingered in the water until the churning abrasiveness of salt water and sand had cleansed me. Finally, I was wide awake and able to process cogent thought. Okay, I'm going to end there. I was trying to make it a little further in, but time is getting away from it. So, I will stop and I will continue next time. We are on page 144 out of a total of about 308 or 9. So, we're almost halfway through. Hope you're still with me. Hope you're enjoying it. I will... See you soon with yet another episode. Buy my books. Buy them on Amazon. Buy them from me. Listen to the podcast. Share the podcast. Buy my music. It's on CD Baby. Share my things that I make, my artistic endeavors, please. It really helps. Have a great week, my friends. I'll talk to you soon. The Paperback Rocker has signed off.